Welcome to the Lexington Cemetery. Numerous sources were consulted in putting together this tour, including Lexington newspapers across the decades, The Lexington Cemetery by Burton Millward, History of Lexington, Kentucky by George Washington Rank, Lexington Heart of the Bluegrass by John D. Wright, The Breckenridges of Kentucky 1760 to 1981 by James C. Clotter and lexcem.org and nps.gov. The Lexington Cemetery was established in 1849 on a 40-acre tract of land purchased from Thomas Boswell. There was already a family graveyard there, and these graves were preserved as part of Section A. Inspired by Mount Auburn Cemetery near Boston, Massachusetts, the Lexington Cemetery was the first landscape part like cemetery in Lexington, Kentucky. Charles S. Bell was the first superintendent and laid out the original grounds along with John Lutz, one of the cemetery's founders. The cemetery contains an arboretum and a wide variety of plants, shrubs, trees, and flowers. There are also two large lakes that provide a home for ducks, swans, and other waterfowl, plus hundreds of large goldfish. The original Gothic gatehouse was designed by John McMurtry, a local builder and architect who was responsible for the look of much of Lexington throughout the 19th century. McMurtry is buried in Section I. On July 13, 1849, an advertisement for cemetery lots appeared in the Lexington Observer and Reporter. The first lot was purchased on August 18th of that year. Robert S. Boyd was the first person to be buried. His body was interred on October 2, 1849. In 1890, the original gatehouse was raised and replaced with the Richardsonian Romanesque gatehouse you see here. The footprint of the cemetery was increased over the years to its current 170 acres. It was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1976. Tour note, as you will be walking on paths that are also used by cars, please take special care to watch and listen for approaching vehicles. To the Henry Clay Monument, Section M. From the Yellow Line Main Avenue, turn left on the paved path with the bus parking sign. Follow the path until you reach the backside of the Henry Clay Monument. Also note here the eastern red bud known to have been growing since 1789. Stop 1 Henry Clay Monument, Section M. Henry Clay was born April 12, 1777 in the Slashes section of Hanover County, Virginia. He died June 29, 1852, in Washington, D.C. Having obtained a law license in Virginia, Clay arrived in Lexington on November 1797. Virtually his entire career was spent in public service. He was first elected to the State House in 1803 and served there until 1806 when he was chosen as U.S. Senator to fill the unexpired term of General Adair. In 1807, he went back to the State House and returned to the U.S. Senate in 1809 to fill the unexpired term of Buckner Thurston. Clay was elected to the House of Representatives in 1811 and was elected Speaker of the House the day he took his seat. In 1824, he ran for U.S. President. He served for Secretary of State from 1825 until 1829. He was elected to the Senate in 1831 and spent a total of 16 years as a senator. He was also the Whig Party nominee for U.S. President in 1832 and 1840. After his death in June 1852, Clay's body laid in state in the U.S. Capitol. The remains of the Great Compromiser, as he was known, were brought back to Ashland, his Lexington home, where his funeral took place. According to newspaper accounts, practically the entire city and many dignitaries from far and wide attended the services. Afterwards, the funeral procession went up Main Street to the Lexington Cemetery. The Episcopal Church conducted the burial service, and the Masonic Fraternity took charge of the body and interred it in the public vault, where it remained until the monument was completed. The day after Clay's death, a group of his friends decided there should be a national monument of colossal proportions erected in the cemetery to mark where his body would lie. After three and a half years, enough money was raised to begin the project. The monument was designed by Lexington civil engineer and architect Julius W. Adams. It was built by John Haley of Frankfurt, and the superintendent of construction was Major Thomas Lewinsky, a prominent Lexington architect. The original statue of clay was sculpted by three Cincinnati artists. The cornerstone of the clay monument in Lexington Cemetery was laid on July 4, 1857. A time capsule was sealed inside the cornerstone, including such items as names of the President and Vice President of the U.S., the names of the President and Directors of the Clay Monumental Association, a copy of each of the Lexington newspapers of the day, a Bible, and a medallion likeness of clay. The monument was completed in 1861. Constructed of magnesium limestone found in Kentucky, it stands 120 feet tall, with a Corinthian-style column consisting of a stereobate, pedestal base, 
shaft and capital, topped by a statue of clay. The statue faces his Lexington estate, Ashland, approximately three miles east of the cemetery. The stereobat, or sub-base, is 20 feet high, 40 feet wide, and is in the Egyptian style. In the center of the southern face is the entrance to a vaulted chamber made of polished Kentucky marble for the sarcophagi. The opening is closed by a bronze screen. Due to the onset of the Civil War, Clay's body was not placed into the monument until April 8, 1864, two days after the death of his wife, Lucretia Hart Clay. Their bodies lay in the sarcophagi side by side. Henry Clay Monument to John Wesley Hunt Monument, Section C. Return to the bus parking paved path. Turn right at the next paved path. The corner of the correct path is noted with a red oak tree identification marker. Follow the path uphill about 50 feet. Section C is on your left, and you should see the large grand obelisk with Elizabeth Miller's name on it. Turn left and walk toward the Miller Obelisk. A few feet behind the obelisk is the John Wesley Hunt Monument. It looks gothic in style and features an obelisk with vines curling around it. Stop 2, John Wesley Hunt, Section C. John Wesley Hunt was born August 1773 in Trenton, New Jersey. He died August 21, 1841 in Lexington, Kentucky. Kentucky's first millionaire, John Wesley Hunt's fortune came from horse breeding and manufacturing hemp. He was also a longtime president of the first bank chartered in Kentucky, known as the Insurance Company. Hunt was a trustee of Transylvania University, and he was a patron of the Orphan Asylum, which came into being in order to care for the children orphaned due to the 1833 cholera epidemic. His residence, Hopemont, was built in 1814 at Mill and 2nd Street. The building, now known as the Hunt Morgan House, is under the care of the Bluegrass Trust for Historic Preservation. Hunt's great-grandson, Thomas Hunt Morgan, won the 1933 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Hunt is buried with his wife, Catherine, in the large Gothic monument inscribed with their birth and death dates. The graves of their children form a circle around them. John Wesley Hunt Monument to Mary Breckenridge Gravesite, Section G. With the Miller Obelisk at your back, turn to the right. Locate a Celtic cross about 8 feet in height. Walk toward this monument. Pass the Celtic cross and continue straight forward until you see the paved path between Section C and Section G. There will be a sign to note the gravesite of John Hunt Morgan on the Section C side of the path. Cross the paved path. You will see the statue of John C. Breckenridge as you enter Section G and you will pass the sign noting his gravesite on your right. As you approach the Breckenridge plot, there is a cross monument with Mary Breckenridge and Frontier Nursing Service inscribed upon it. Stop 3, Mary Breckenridge, Section G. Mary Breckenridge was born February 17, 1881, in Memphis, Tennessee. She died May 16, 1965, at Westover, her home in Leslie County, Kentucky. She earned a nursing degree at St. Luke's Hospital in New York City and took graduate courses in midwifery in London, England, becoming a certified nurse midwife. During World War I, she worked with a visiting nurse service in France. Her experience overseas... Her concern for people living in isolated mountain communities in southeastern Kentucky and the memory of her two children who died very young inspired her to start the Kentucky Committee of Mothers and Babies in 1925. Within the next three years, this evolved into the Frontier Nursing Service located in Hyden, Kentucky. Up until this time, babies were delivered by the father or a neighbor. Traveling by horseback, certified nurse midwives dispensed prenatal care and attended the births. This care by medical professionals substantially decreased the number of maternal deaths. In 1989, after 64 years of operation, the Frontier Nursing Service had served more than 90,000 patients and assisted in 22,477 births, with a loss of only 11 mothers in childbirth. When the Frontier Nursing Service began, it was staffed by British nurses who were already qualified as midwives or American-born nurses who were sent to England for training in midwifery. The Frontier Graduate School of Midwifery opened in Hyden in 1939 to train midwives in the United States. Frontier Nursing University, as it is now known, expanded its degree offerings to other nursing specialties and uses a community-based education model, allowing its students to stay in their communities, doing their coursework online, and learning clinical skills and medical facilities within their communities. Mary Breckenridge Gravesite to the Todd Family Plot, Section F. Return to the paved path between Section G and C. 
It should be at your back if you're facing Mary Breckenridge's gravesite. Turn left on the path and walk straight forward until you come to the intersection of the unlined path and the yellow-lined main avenue. The sign for Section F is on your right. At the yellow line path, turn right. Continue down the path until you see the sign marking the Todd family, Lincoln's in-laws, on your right. Turn right into the Todd family plot. Feel free to explore the stones of this founding Kentucky family. Stop for Todd family plot, section F. The Todds were the in-laws of Abraham Lincoln. David H. Todd was a great-grandfather of Mary Todd Lincoln. He was born April 8, 1723 in County Armagh, Ireland, and died February 8, 1785 in Kentucky. Todd's body was interred in the Lexington Cemetery June 19, 1856. Levi Todd was Mary Todd Lincoln's grandfather. He was born October 4, 1756 in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, and died September 6, 1807. He was interred in the Lexington Cemetery December 8, 1849. Levi Todd came to Harrodsburg, Kentucky from Virginia in 1775 as a lieutenant under George Rogers Clark. He fought in the American Revolution, surviving the Battle of Blue Licks, and eventually became a major general in the Kentucky militia. Levi Todd was one of the first lot owners in the city of Lexington and served as clerk of the District Court of Kentucky. He later became the clerk of the Circuit Court of Fayette County and held that office until he died. The inscription on his tombstone reads, A youthful adventurer to Kentucky, and active in its defense in the most perilous of times. Robert Smith Todd was Mary Todd Lincoln's father. He was born February 25, 1791, and died July 16, 1849. He lived his entire life in Lexington, Kentucky. Though trained as a lawyer, he had careers in business and the military, serving in the 5th Regiment Kentucky Volunteers during the War of 1812. He was quite interested in politics, serving as a member of the Fayette Fiscal Court and the City Council. He was elected clerk of the Kentucky House of Representatives in 1821 and held that position for 20 years. In 1845, he was elected to Kentucky State Senate. Robert Smith died in 1849, a victim of the cholera epidemic. Robert Smith Todd and Mary Lincoln's mother, Eliza Parker Todd, were first interred in the Baptist graveyard on Main Street and then moved to the Lexington Cemetery when it opened. The Todd Family Plot to James Masterson, Section K. Return to the Yellow Line Main Avenue, turn right on the path. On your left is Section K. Continue until you see a large, dark gray granite monument with the name Hearn. There is a fleur de lis engraved at the top of the monument. About 10 feet back from the Main Avenue is a small, rounded headstone. This is the marker for James Masterson. Stop 5, James Masterson, Section K. James Masterson was born April 7, 1752, in Fairfax County, Virginia. He died December 15, 1838, in Lexington, Kentucky. An incident in the Revolutionary War, James Masterson came to Kentucky in 1779 and helped build the first blockhouse on what is now the corner of Main and Mill Streets. In his obituary in the Kentucky Gazette, published December 20, 1838, it stated Masterson was perhaps the oldest citizen of Fayette County in his 87th year. He was buried with military honors, attended by uniformed companies and an immense concourse of citizens who had long known and appreciated his worth. Masterson was originally buried near his home and was removed to the Lexington Cemetery in 1852. He is the namesake of Masterson Station, a neighborhood in northwest Lexington. James Masterson to Clay Family Plot, Section J. Return to the Yellow Line Main Avenue. Turn right. Backtrack on the path. Walk past the four-way intersection of sections F, G, K, and J. Section J is on your right. Walk until you find a pine tree with a forked trunk on the right-hand side. The Mary Jane Warfield Clay Monument is behind the tree. Stop 6, Clay Family Plot, Section J. There are branches of the Clay family buried throughout the Lexington Cemetery. In this section, we are focusing on Mary Jane Warfield Clay and her children. She had 10 children, most, though not all, of whom are buried around her, and as typical in that time, two of those children died in infancy. Mary Jane Warfield Clay was born January 20, 1815, in Lexington, Kentucky, and died April 29, 1900, in Lexington, Kentucky. 
She was married to the abolitionist Cassius Marcellus Clay, who was buried in Richmond Cemetery in Madison County. Cassius Clay was away from home during much of their marriage, which meant that Mary Jane not only had to take care of the house and the children, but also manage his business affairs and pay off the debts he had incurred all on her own. The Clays had a troubled relationship, and Cassius eventually divorced Mary Jane after 44 years of marriage. Though Mary Jane had not only maintained her husband's property, but expanded their dwelling and increased his financial worth during his many absences, she was not entitled to any recompense or even the custody of their children under the laws of the day. Her treatment during the contentious divorce led her and her daughters, particularly Mary Barr and Laura, to become involved in advocating for women's rights. Her eldest daughter, Mary Barr Clay, was born October 13, 1839, in Lexington, and died October 12, 1924, in Richmond, Kentucky. She was the first one in the family to become involved in the cause of women's rights. She attended the National Women's Suffrage Association Convention in 1879, where she met Susan B. Anthony. Mary Barclay invited her to speak in Kentucky that fall. A rival organization called the American Women's Suffrage Association also interested Clay, and she participated in that group along with the NWSA. Mary Barclay became president of the AWSA in 1883. Laura Clay was born February 9, 1849 in Richmond, Kentucky and died June 29, 1941 in Lexington, Kentucky. She is probably best known suffragist in the state. While she supported temperance, she did not support prohibition. However, Laura Clay realized there was much more sympathy for prohibition in the country than suffrage, so she used prohibition as a way to get attention for the issue of suffrage. She and other like-minded reformers argued that women's suffrage could be a way to get prohibition made into law. She organized the Kentucky Equal Rights Association in 1888 and became its first president. This organization took a broader view of women's rights than merely gaining access to the ballot. They advocated equality in all aspects for women. Laura also served as an auditor for the National American Woman Suffrage Association from 1895 to 1911, a position of significant influence in determining policy. In 1920, she became the first woman whose name was placed in nomination at a Democratic presidential convention. Clay Family Plot to Hal Price Headley, Section J. Return to the Yellow Line Path. Turn right, keeping Section J on your right, and walk until you see the large Healy obelisk on your right. Enter the Healy plot and walk toward the obelisk. Hal Price Healy is in the row of small stones closest to the obelisk, the second from the left. Stop number seven, Hal Price Healy, Section J. Hal Price Healy was born December 19, 1888, in Lexington, Kentucky. He died March 22, 1962, in Lexington, Kentucky. Hal Price Healy owned Beaumont Farm. One of the country's most successful thoroughbred horsemen, he was also chairman of the organizing committee of Keeneland Racetrack, first president of the Keeneland Association, leading owner of the first race meeting in 1936, and a founder of the Keeneland Horse Sales. He died at Keeneland while supervising the training of his horses. In 2018, Headley was inducted into the Racing Hall of Fame in the Pillars of the Turf category, which honors individuals who have made extraordinary contributions to thoroughbred racing in a leadership or pioneering capacity at the highest national level. Hal Price Headley to Emil Fisk, Section R. Return to the Yellow Line Main Avenue and turn right. Walk downhill toward the lake. You should be able to hear the fountain here. There will be a short path on the left, marked with a sign for the lake and an arrow to the garden. Take this path. On your left is Section R, and you can see the statue of the little boy on top of a headstone from the path. Enter Section R to get a closer look at the intricate headstone and footstone for Emil Fisk. Stop 8, Emil Fisk, Section R. Emil Fisk was born September 3, 1867 in Covington, Kentucky. He died January 14, 1881. While many notable individuals are buried in Lexington Cemetery, the vast majority are just ordinary people, such as Emil Fisk, who died of a disease at the age of 13. While visiting relatives in Lexington, Emil came to the Lexington Cemetery and chose this spot overlooking the lakes as his future burial site. The monument, made of white lead, is a likeness of Emil. The grave has a footstone topped with a bird to match the birds in the hat of the statue. The story goes that while he was bedridden, two doves would alight on his windowsill each morning, which made the boy very happy. That said, doves are commonly found in cemeteries as symbols of purity and peace. The base of the statue has a lily, also a symbol of purity as well as a symbol of renewal and resurrection. The inscription on the front says his body is laid at this spot at his own request. The back side of the base has this inscription. Emil, leaving us said, I have always tried to be a good boy. 
I believe in both God and Christ. I learned to love them in the Sunday school. Mama, Papa, Otis, kiss me goodbye. Do not grieve for me. You will soon come and be with me, and we will all be together again in happy in heaven. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Emil Fisk to Lieutenant Hugh McKee, Section P. Lieutenant McKee's monument is usually hidden behind some foliage. You'll be approaching from the right side of the monument for clearer directions. Return to the short path with the arrow shaped sign noting the garden. Turn left. Turn left at the very next paved path. Walk uphill. Pass the bush obelisk on your right. Section R and Emil Fisk are on your left. Pass the large bush that is just past the Bush family obelisk. Stop at the marker for George McKee at your right. Straight behind the marker for George McKee is a tall obelisk, the top of which is visible above the bush and looks like a draped urn. Feel free to move the foliage out of the way to get a better view of the military monument. Stop 9, Lieutenant Hugh McKee, Section P. Lieutenant Hugh McKee was born April 23, 1844, in Lexington, Kentucky. He died June 11, 1871, in Korea, while serving on board of the Monocracy. The son of Colonel W.R. McKee, who was killed in the Mexican-American War, Hugh McKee graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1866. He was killed while leading an assault upon a fort in Korea known as the Citadel, where the United States was trying to establish trade relations. The Citadel was captured and subsequently renamed Fort McKee in honor of the lieutenant's bravery in being the first man to reach the fort. In 1872, diplomatic and trade relations were established between the United States and Korea. McKee's elaborate monument is topped with an urn, a very common 19th century funerary symbol, covered with a draped American flag. An article published in the Kentucky Gazette on August 28, 1872, describes the monument as made of Italian marble, and upon the base and the shaft are the names of the different vessels upon which he served, his name, date of birth, date of death, and a testimony to his high courage and worth by his commanding officer. There is also a handsome escutcheon with various national emblems all done in marble. Lieutenant Yuma Key to Moses Kaufman, Section E1. Return to the paved path that is at your back when facing the George McKee Stone. Turn left and proceed downhill. At the intersection of this path and the garden sign path, turn left. The lake will be on your right. Continue on this path until you reach a fork with a wood railed bridge on your right. Cross the bridge and at the next fork in the path, take the left side. Continue down the path. The next sign you'll see is on the right. It's the sign for Section I-1. Take the next right. On your left is section E1. Follow the path uphill, then take the next left. Locate the large wild stone. Turn left behind the wild stone. Walk to the left past several more wild monuments until you locate the Kaufman stone on your right. Stop 10, Moses Kaufman, section E1. Moses Kaufman was born January 15, 1843, in Bavaria, Germany. He died October 10, 1924, in Lexington, Kentucky. Moses Kaufman is buried in one of two Jewish sections of the Lexington Cemetery. He was a member of the Spinoza Society, which purchased the original lot for Jewish burials. Besides founding the firm, which eventually became the Kaufman Clothing Company, he was one of the organizers of Temple of Death Israel. Kaufman was Lexington's first German and Jewish councilman, a position he held for 17 years. He also served in the state legislature and served as postmaster from 1914 to 1923. His obituary in the Lexington Leader stated that he had held an exalted place in the esteem of Lexington citizenry. Moses Kaufman to the Breckenridge Family Plot, Section O. Facing the Kaufman Stone, turn and walk to your left until you reach the paved path bordering Section E1. Turn right and go uphill. You'll come to a three-way intersection, and on your right will be a metal bench. You can see the sign for Section D1 from here. Turn left. Continue on the paved path under several weeping willows. This is the longest part of the tour, but also the most scenic. As you exit the canopy of the weeping willows, take the left-hand fork of the path. Pass the Do Not Enter sign. That's for cars, not for folks on a stroll like you. Continue past more weeping willows. The next sign you will see is for Section C1 on your left. Stay true on this path. As you round the bend, you'll see the floral garden on your left. Next, you'll come to a sign for Section T on your right. The green line noting this, West Main Avenue, begins around here. Continue straight ahead. The National Cemetery is on your right. Section O is on your left. 
At the next fork off of the Green Line West Main Avenue, take the unlined left-hand side path. Go uphill. Section O is still on your left. Locate the large, almost blue obelisk noting the Breckenridge family plot. Stop 11, the Breckenridge family plot, section O. Like the Clays, there are several Breckenridge family plots throughout the Lexington Cemetery. A few branches of the Breckenridge family are buried here in section O. We'll take a look at four of the most notable members. Robert Jefferson Breckenridge was born March 8, 1800 in Fayette County, Kentucky, and died December 27, 1871 in Danville, Kentucky. He was one of the 25 founders of the Lexington Cemetery Corporation. He practiced law and was elected to the Kentucky Legislature in 1825 and served until 1830. He was also the State Superintendent of Instruction. While in that position, he persuaded the Constitutional Convention of 1849 to include provisions for public schools. You'll note that Robert Jefferson's obelisk bears the inscription, Minister of the Gospel, for he spent most of his life as an ordained Presbyterian minister. Paradoxically, he was against slavery, though he did own slaves, and strongly supported the Union during the Civil War. He also chaired the convention that nominated Abraham Lincoln. Along with others, he started the Danville Review, a pro-Union newspaper. William Campbell Preston Breckenridge, called Willie by his family, was born August 28, 1837, near Baltimore, Maryland, and died November 19, 1904, in Lexington, Kentucky. He is the son of the Reverend Robert Jefferson Breckenridge and graduated from Center College and the Law School of Louisville. Unlike his father, he was an ardent supporter of the Confederacy and served as a colonel of the 9th Kentucky Cavalry. He was an editor of the Lexington Observer and reporter for two years, and many years later became an editorial writer for the Lexington Morning Herald. In 1884, he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives and served for 10 years. His bid for re-election was thwarted by a scandal that gained national attention. In 1893, he was taken to court by 27-year-old Madeline Pollard on a breach of promise suit. The former Sarah Female Institute student said her illicit relations with Breckenridge dated back to her school years and that he had promised to marry her after his second wife died, which he failed to do. He lost the suit and his re-election thanks to the combined efforts of women's coalition and ministerial groups. Built in 1930, originally as a dormitory, Breckenridge Hall at the University of Kentucky is named after W.C.P. Breckenridge. Safanisba Preston Breckenridge was born April 1, 1866 in Lexington, Kentucky and died July 30, 1948 in Chicago, Illinois. She is the daughter of William Campbell Preston Breckenridge and the niece of Mary DeShay. She graduated from Wellesley College and attended law school at the University of Kentucky. She was the first woman admitted to the Kentucky Bar Association. Finding few clients in Lexington, she moved to Chicago to start a new career. She became the first woman to earn a Ph.D. in political science at the University of Chicago and in 1904, the first woman to earn a J.D. in its law school. Her association with Jane Addams led into the area of social services. She joined the faculty of the University of Chicago and later became dean of the Graduate School of Social Service Administration, helping found the Social Science Review. Breckenridge Hall of the University of Chicago is named in her honor. She energetically participated in a wide range of reforms including women's suffrage, improving factory conditions for women and children, juvenile courts, improving conditions in tenements, and supporting the rights of immigrants. She also helped found the Chicago Women's Trade Union and the Chicago chapter of the NAACP. Her life is neatly summed up by the epitaph on her gravestone, Scholar, Teacher, Humanitarian. John Bain Breckenridge, who is the great-grandson of Robert Jefferson Breckenridge and the great-nephew of William Campbell Preston Breckenridge, was born November 29, 1913 in Washington, D.C. and died July 29, 1979 in Lexington, Kentucky. He graduated from the University of Kentucky, worked for the Department of Justice, and fought in World War II, attaining the rank of colonel. He practiced law in Lexington and eventually entered the political arena, serving two terms in the Kentucky House of Representatives. He was elected Attorney General in 1959 and 1967, and then became the sixth Kentucky Breckenridge to sit in the U.S. Congress in 1973. He served until 1979. The Breckenridges to John George Stoll, Section S. Return to the paved path that is at your back if you face the Breckenridge Obelisk. Turn left and walk uphill. Take the right fork in the path. This is Section S. There are no visible signs for Section S. On your left will be a large monument to R.P. Stoll. Facing the monument so you can see the R.P. Stoll engraving, John George Stoll's marker is on the right side, second from the left in the row. Stop 12, John George Stoll, Section S. John George Stoll was born September 8, 1878 in Lexington, Kentucky. He died August 26, 1959 in Lexington, Kentucky. 
John George Stoll, was a businessman who was active in Republican politics both locally and statewide. During his career, he was president of the Lexington Water Company, the First National Bank, and the Phoenix Hotel, and served in other high-ranking banking positions. Stoll was also a trustee of the Lexington Cemetery Company from 1943 through 1959. In 1914, Stoll and eight associates purchased the Lexington Leader. Within five years, he became the sole owner. The August 26, 1959 editorial Lexington Leader described his editorial policy for that newspaper. As editor of the Leader, he adhered strictly to the editorial policy of supporting those things that were considered to be for the best interests of Lexington and Kentucky and opposing what was evil and contrary to the welfare of the community. In August 1937, Stoll purchased the Lexington Herald, a Democratic newspaper, from the nuns, and he insisted it maintain its own editorial policy. From an editorial published in the Lexington Herald on August 27, 1959, Stoll recognized the right of the public to hear all sides of any public question, political or otherwise, and insisted on the clear and honest presentation of all the facts. The Herald Leader Company was incorporated in 1952 to publish the Herald, the Leader, and the Sunday Herald Leader. Both papers were printed at the Leader plant. Stoll was the owner and principal stockholder of the Herald Leader Company and remained editor and publisher of the Lexington Leader. John George Stoll to James Lane Allen, Section D. Step back on the paved path behind John George Stoll. Turn right, going uphill. Keep right, continuing uphill. At the next fork, there is a tree with four trunks. Take the right-hand side path. Section H is on your right. You'll pass a paved path on your right, splitting Section D from Section H. There is a sign for Section D here. Continue straight on the path you're on with Section D on your right until you see a weeping angel monument with the name Fraser on it. Turn right into Section D by the Fraser Monument and walk back until you locate the large Allen Obelisk. A special stone for James Lane Allen is at the left of this obelisk between it and the Johnson Obelisk. Stop 13 in James Lane Allen, Section D. James Lane Allen was born December 21, 1849 in Fayette County, Kentucky. He died February 18, 1925 in New York, New York. James Lane Allen graduated from Transylvania University and taught school for several years before moving to New York City and becoming a full-time writer. He was one of the most popular American authors in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. His novel, The Choir Invisible, was set in Lexington of the 1790s. The Children's Fountain of Youth in Gratz Park was erected with funds he had bequeathed to the city of Lexington. James Lane Allen's headstone has an engraving of an open book and a quill at the top. His desk and chair portrait, and copies of some of his books can be found at the Central Library of the Lexington Public Library. James Lane Allen to Mary Deshay, Section D. Return to the path on your right, past the Weeping Fraser Angel, and turn right. Keep Section D on your right as you walk downhill. Take the right-hand side path at the fork, continuing downhill. At the second fork, take the right-hand path again, returning to the Green Line West Main Avenue. Continue on the Green Line path until you see the large Inskeep Monument on your right. Enter Section D again here. Directly behind the Inskeep Monument is a marker for Mary Deshay placed by the Daughters of the American Revolution. Stop 14, Mary Deshay, Section D. Mary Deshay was born March 8, 1850 in Lexington, Kentucky and died January 11, 1929 in Washington, D.C. She is the granddaughter of Governor Joseph Deshay and the daughter of John Randolph Deshay, a prominent Lexington doctor. She studied for a short time at what is now the University of Kentucky. She started her career as a teacher, first at a private school with her mother, and later at Dudley School on the corner of Maxwell and Mill Streets. Today, there is a historical marker on Maxwell Street near that corner dedicated to her. Mary Deshay moved to Washington, D.C. in 1885 to take a job as a clerk. She remained in Washington the rest of her days except for a short teaching stint in Sitka, Alaska. When in 1890, the Sons of the American Revolution vetoed a proposition to admit women, she and three other women joined together to organize the Daughters of the American Revolution and recruited Mrs. Benjamin Harrison, the president's wife, to be its first president. Her fellow daughters honored her memory with the first memorial service ever held in Memorial Continental Hall, the oldest building of the DAR complex. Her monument, bearing the DAR seal, was dedicated December 16, 1915. The Mary Deshay chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution is in Washington, D.C., not Kentucky. As you go through Section D, you also see well-known Lexington names such as McDowell, Parker, and Van Meter. Benjamin Gratz is interred, along with his son, Captain Kerry G. Gratz, who was the first soldier buried in the Lexington Cemetery. Mary Deshay to William King Solomon, Section A. 
Return to the Green Line West Main Avenue. Continue on the Green Line path until it ends at an intersection with the Yellow Line Main Avenue. This is a fair stretch. Turn left on the Yellow Line path. The sign for Section A will be on your right. Take a right onto the White Line East Main Avenue. Walk until you come to the sign pointing to King Solomon's Grave on the right hand side. His stone is just a few feet past the sign and is quite large. Stop 15, William King Solomon, Section A. William Solomon was born 1775 in Virginia. He died in 1854 in Lexington, Kentucky. We end the tour with the grave of an ordinary man who had an extraordinary influence on Lexington through his selfless actions. The cholera epidemic of 1833 killed 500 Lexingtonians within two months. Much of the population fled the city, but William King Solomon, often described as a vagrant and a drunkard, stayed behind and buried the bodies in the Old Baptist Cemetery. Though a large number of people attended his burial in 1854, he lay in an unmarked grave for 40 years until the superintendent of the cemetery placed a stone there. A fitting monument was dedicated to him in 1908, paid for by a drive led by John Wilson Townsend, a Lexington historian who was also buried in this cemetery. The inscription on the back of the tomb, William Adams and Sons, refers to the local monument company that created the memorial. There are two inscriptions on the top of the tomb. The hero of the 1833 cholera epidemic is self-explanatory. The other inscription, for had he not a royal heart, is from James Lane Allen's story, King Solomon of Kentucky, published in Allen's first book, Flute and Violin. William King Solomon back to office. Return to the White Line East Main Avenue. Turn left. Follow the White Line path until it meets the Yellow Line Main Avenue. Turn left on the Yellow Line path and follow it until you reach office parking. This concludes our tour. Thank you for joining Lexington Public Library on this walk through Lexington's past and present. If you enjoyed the tour, check out our other tours on our website at www.lexpublib.org slash walking tours.